To the People's War Radio Show. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. And I'm Dexter Mlawingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24 7. At the height of the African Revolution of the 1960s, Italian communist filmmaker Gillo Pontecorvo released what is possibly his magnus opus, the greatest work of his career, The Battle of Algiers. The Battle of Algiers was shot in the streets of Algiers in a documentary style dramatizing a key period in the Algerian independence struggle against French colonialism. The film has much to teach us now, as the struggle against Western colonialism and neocolonialism rages around the world. It explores the role of Islam and anti-colonial resistance throughout Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and the Americas, and it shows how an outgunned people can win against a powerful oppressor. The Battle of Algiers film was released in September 1966, 55 years ago, and made a crucial mark on the international African revolution, including the formation of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which was founded just weeks after the release of the film on October 15, 1966, in Oakland, California. Ponte Carvo's classic film, The Battle of Algiers, chronicles the real-life Battle of Algiers campaign that began a decade before the release of the film in September 1956 and lasted through September 1957. The historic Battle of Algiers was a guerrilla campaign waged by the National Liberation Front, FLN, the revolutionary party that led Algeria to independence from France. The film, The Battle of Algiers, brings to life the tactics and strategies that the Algerian people used to win their liberation from French colonial rule. For African viewers, the film displayed examples of anti-colonial struggle and African unity. The hero of the film is Ali Amar, known more widely as Ali Lapointe. Ali was a formerly incarcerated person who came into political organization following his release from prison. Ali eventually became a lieutenant in the FLN and a leader in the Battle of Algiers. Homeless children such as Petit Omar and women such as Jamila, Zora, and Hasiba also play crucial roles in a liberation struggle. The Battle of Algiers also exposed the French colonial domination of Algeria and the brutal counterinsurgent assault on the Muslim community of the Kasbah. The French military tortured, murdered, and intimidated the Algerian people en route to a, quote, French victory, unquote, in the Battle of Algiers. The French victory was completely pyrrhic. They won the battle, but lost the war. In fact, I must admit that I had seen the film several times before I even realized that the French had declared their assault on the Kasbah of victory. The Battle of Algiers film did not emerge in a vacuum. It clearly engaged a revolutionary theory of France Fanon, as well as radical cinema coming out of Africa and other parts of the colonized world. Since its release, the Battle of Algiers has been studied by colonial armies and anti-colonial forces alike. In the early years of the American invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, the Pentagon held a public showing of the Battle of Algiers at the Defense Department to study the French's failure. They called it, quote, how to win a battle against terrorism and lose the war of ideas. The recent U.S. defeat in Afghanistan raises the significance of this film once again. To discuss this with us today, we have Professor Sahel Dolatai. Born on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, Sohail is currently a professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies, the Department of African American Studies, and the Program in Global Middle East Studies at the University of California, Irvine. His research-based practice explores the afterlives of empire and utilizes scholarship, essay, short film, video, and the curatorial. He has directed short films and videos with Yasin Bey, a.k.a. Most Deaf, Zach De La Rocha, A Rage Against the Machine, and the band Algiers. Sohail has also authored and co-edited a total of five books, Born to Use Mics, Reading Nas' Illmatic, Return of the Mecca, The Art of Islam and Hip Hop, With Stones in Our Hands, Writings on Muslims, Racism and Empire, Black Star, Crescent Moon, 
the Muslim International, and Black Freedom Beyond America, and 50 Years of the Battle of Algiers, past its prologue. Welcome to the show, Sahir. I appreciate you, you both for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, what an amazing introduction and, and backdrop uh, that you guys provided. So, yeah, I'm so glad to be here. And great to have you on, brother. Oh, oh. So, as we celebrate the 55th anniversary of the Battle of Algiers, I recall meeting you about seven years ago or so while you were writing the book on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Algiers. Anti-colonial struggle has continued to advance since we first met. As well, I have noticed a resurgent tradition of anti-colonial filmmaking, which includes a revisiting of some classic films from the past, including The Battle of Algiers. So can you recall the first time that you saw the film and what what attracted you to it? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, um, you know, it's hard to kind of overstate um, how significant that film was for me um, as a young person um, and the kind of trajectory it put me on. I mean, I had been hearing about that film, you know, from elders. I was like maybe 17 and it just kind of kept on coming up and I didn't really put two and two together in any kind of significant way um, until I was at like a, uh, a public library and, and, and they had a copy of it. And I remember seeing it and just saying, oh, you know, okay, here it is. And I had some time. Let me, let me, you know, we pop it in. They had those kind of like, uh, you know, stations where you could play it. And I remember watching it and, and just being blown away that a film like this could be made, you know, and this was, you know, we're talking about now over, you know, 30, 35 years ago, you know, and, and just thinking that, wow, I, could, I can't believe that a film like this was made. And, and, and to be honest, and I think this is something we'll probably get into. Like, I, I don't think a film, since then has been made like that, you know? Um, and so it, it just really had a profound effect on me in terms of how to do something that marries a kind of radical politics um, with a, just a riveting story uh, and just these really like sympathetic characters that gave dignity to them, you know? And, and, and for me, it just led me on this path of trying to explore and, you know, create ideas through art and culture that could move people. You know what I mean? And that really led me into kind of like ultimately going to film school at USC and getting a PhD and kind of studying, you know, the power that um, images and ideas have when put through music or, or film, you know? There was a kind of recognition that I had with what was happening there in, in small ways um, that really had a profound effect on just me personally in terms of like, you know, again, like I mentioned, some of the kind of, you know, trajectory I went on in terms of school and whatnot and the stuff I studied, but just on a personal level in terms of like what it meant for me to see something like that on a screen, which in, in, in a powerful way, not in an apologetic way. Um, not in a way that was like asking for acceptance, but it was a kind of dignified stand. And I just, it, it still resonates to me. I still watch that film and, and get chills, you know, watching it. So, yeah. Right, right, right. No, I really appreciate that answer, brother. And, um, you know, to me, that really emphasized just the significance of, you know, revolutionary culture, you know, revolutionary film, music, and how it, how it inspires us all to really um, continue the struggle. You know, so I really appreciate the impact that that it's had. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, though uh, Ali Lapointe uh, could be classified as the hero in the film, there is no single protagonist. Why is that an important strategy in the film? Yeah, I mean, I think it's central to the film, right? And, and it, it, it was also central to the anti-colonial and national liberation struggles that were going on. And again, I think this is what's powerful about this film because, I mean, on the one hand, like you watch the film and, 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 it, and it looks like a documentary film in some ways. It's shot in black and white. And those are, those are very uh, conscious choices on the part of, of, of the filmmaking crew and, uh, to, to do it in black and white. They could have shot it in color, but no, they wanted it to look, look like newsreel. Uh, footage. They wanted it to look like documentary. And in fact, when they showed it in American theaters for the first time, audiences were kind of shocked by what they were watching. They thought that they had come to see a fictional film and it, it looked like they were watching a documentary. And so they had to put like a, uh, a kind of qualifying statement at the beginning of the film that like not, 
you know, not one piece of, of, of footage in this film is, is newsreel footage. This is a film. But it, I, I love the way it walked the line because, of course, the film is, you know, and we can maybe get to this later, but the film is shot on location in actual locations where skirmishes and fights and bombs were, were, were dropped and had in cafes and whatnot. And, and it actually employs actual Algerians involved in the struggle, right? Saad Yassef, who is uh, Jafar in the film, was the actual leader of the FLN in the Casbah and was arrested by the French. He was one of the most wanted men in the French Empire. Um, and was sentenced to death, and so was writing his memoirs in prison that were called Memories of the Battle of Algiers. And of course, you know, as the war goes on and the truce is created and negotiations happen, he's released. And then he uses his memoirs from the Battle of Algiers to, to decide to make a film out of it, right? And so he's the one who's really the driving force. He's the one who seeks out Ponte Corvo. He's the one who brings Ponte Corvo to Algiers to to make the film. And he plays then himself as Jafar in the film, right? So the film is blurring these lines between documentary and, and fiction. I think that's where its power lies. It's like it's walking this tightrope. And that gives it, I think, its kind of visceral quality. But more specifically to your question about like the single protagonist versus the collective, you know, as a backdrop to, to, to the listeners maybe is like when Yasef was traveling to Italy to, to talk to Ponte Corvo about the film, Ponte Corvo already had a script for the film. He already, because the Algerian struggle, and I think we'll talk about this as well, had kind of captured the kind of anti-colonial third worldist imagination. And so he was already working on a script and he had already gotten word that uh, Paul Newman, who was one of the biggest actors at the time, was going to play an American journalist who was going to kind of drop into Algiers and cover both sides of the conflict. And Yasef, of course, was like, we're not having that, right? We're not going to have one, first of all, an American come in. Two, we're not going to have a white guy come in, right? Whether he's French or American, that this is about the Algerian people. And so he then convinces Ponte Corvo to, and Solanus to come, uh, Solanus to come to Algiers to, to, to live there for six months. Cause this is, this is 1963, early 64 when the revolution had just ended. And so they then stay there, meet a bunch of people who had fought and they rewrite a completely different script as a result. And so the point about making it what uh, Edward Said called it a, a choral protagonist, right? A chorus of people. Um, I mean, ultimately, like we get to this very fundamental question, right? Within kind of uh, the West's understanding of itself, its philosophical understanding of itself, which is that the individual is the unit and engine of history, right? Individual liberty, individual rights, et cetera, et cetera. And what the anti-colonial movements were doing um, and the national liberation struggles were trying to, to trying to say was not that it's not individuals that make history. It's collectives that make history. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. I think um, I want to say that the chapter in one of your books is called like the camera as weapon or something like that. Making Cam- it to- the camera, the camera as gun. Yeah, that's what it is. The camera has gone really underscoring uh, the point that you were uh, making and really the intentionality or the what we would say the to what end uh, that the films were uh, being made uh, at that time. So I ask you this. How did the Battle of Algiers counter the colonial depiction of Arab, Muslim and African people uh, at that time? Historically, you know, within mainstream Hollywood cinema, right, um, dominant Hollywood cinema, and even some of the European productions that were happening, right? The the third world was a kind of exotic, quote unquote, exotic backdrop, right? Like that just contained the natives, which you know, which really for them meant the savages, right? They were, we were like a backdrop to their kind of colonial fantasies, right? So you had then these white protagonists in these different third world settings. And again, you know, the, one of the most emblematic ones is Casablanca, right? Uh, but there's so many others that we could talk about that were films that were made in the 30s and in the early 40s that really placed these white protagonists in in these, you know, third world settings. And we were just backdrop. We were almost like window dressing or set design. We didn't have any speaking parts. We had just, you know, we were functionaries to you know, white lives, right? And and the Battle of Algiers is the first film to foreground third world subjects, third world people, right? And not only that, they're speaking 
Maghrebi Arabic. They're speaking, they're linguistic, they have linguistic integrity in the film. And that's that was fundamentally a shift from what had come before. In the past, we had either we either didn't speak at all, or when we spoke, it was like some broken English, which made us sound like we were somehow, you know, less intelligent than the Europeans um, or white people. Or we spoke in gibberish, and, and we can think about, for example, in the United States with the Western, right? The films that are, that are that, you know, the, the, the Western film. And so the Battle of Algiers, you know, reclaims that space and gives Algerians linguistic integrity. But I think beyond that, it also presents them as dignified in their resistance to French colonial occupation, right? And again, I think this is a a huge distinction between. What some argue is what we should be doing as black or POC filmmakers or artists is we have to humanize ourselves. Right. And, and I think I have an issue with why, why we, we don't need to humanize ourselves to a viewer. Right. To create sympathy. I think I think that that's a dead end, because if they don't already think that we're humans, then we have nothing to really talk about. Right. And I think what that Battle of Algiers did for me was it wasn't about humanizing the Algerians. Uh, it already presumed they were humans, but it showed and gave them dignity in their resistance to French colonial occupation. You know, you attribute the film, The Battle of Algiers, and, and, and in fact, the rise of what's called uh, Third Cinema to France Fanon. So first, uh, what is Third Cinema? Also, uh, can you explain the links between the writings of France Fanon and The Battle of Algiers and Third Cinema more generally? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is this is a pivotal question. What I think we have to establish is, well, if there's third cinema, what's first and second cinema? Because this is what third cinema is in response to. Right. And first cinema was seen as dominant Hollywood cinema. Right. Dominant mainstream cinema. And I think it's really important to underscore how powerful Hollywood as a cinematic industry, as an industrial apparatus was globally, especially after World War II, when the U.S. kind of imposes this as part of even its Marshall Plan to Europe, but its aid that it spreads around the world is about kind of making space for Hollywood cinema to kind of infect, if you will, the globe in terms of like different peoples around the world and their influence and how Hollywood influences them. And we can then get into what ideas are being projected in Hollywood films, right, to these people about, you know, capitalism and their role and relationship to it, et cetera. So first cinema is mainstream Hollywood cinema. Second cinema uh, was considered like European art house cinema, right? So this is more kind of arty experimental film uh, that was a response to first cinema, but it really was in some ways art for art's sake. It was playing with form, it was playing with genre, but it was experimental art film. And third cinema said, no, first of all, obviously dominant Hollywood cinema is capitalist exploitative cinema. Second cinema is self-absorbed kind of filmmaking, right? Um, that's art for art's sake. We want to make films that are about raising a revolutionary kind of consciousness or an awareness of people about their relationships to these systems of exploitation, right? Right. And so third cinema emerges out of that. And third cinema, and again, it's, it's really important to distinguish between third cinema and third world cinema, right? Third world cinema is just films that just get made in the third world, right? So, for example, Bollywood cinema, it's, of course, look at the name, Bollywood. It's named after Hollywood, and it is made in the so-called third world at the, you know, at the time, maybe. Um, but, you know, so it was made in the third world, but it wasn't doing anything to challenge Right. Or raise kind of revolutionary consciousness in, in, in a way. So third cinema sought to distinguish itself from third world cinema. It said, no, we're, we're so that third cinema wasn't spatially or geographically located. That's so that it could emerge then, for example, in like the United States with black independent film, film filmmakers in the late 60s, early 70s, like the L.A. Rebellion School. Right. Like they took up the mantle of third cinema in a U.S. context, as did many others. So third cinema is about understanding its relationship to first and second cinema. And so Fanon, because Fanon's writings had become so influential in like the global south and the third world. Right. And the anti-colonial struggles, many of the filmmakers and, and you know, for example, Solanas and Gatino, who are Arch Argentinian critics and filmmakers, they make an amazing kind of six hour manifesto masterpiece called The Hour of the Furnaces. Right. And in The Hour of the Furnaces, they're quoting Fanon. 
Fanon really becomes central to thinking about this because Fanon was really invested in uh, how to raise revolutionary consciousness. But he also recognized in his famous essay in Wretched of the Earth on national culture, the central role that culture has in shaping kind of that revolutionary consciousness, right? So, so filmmakers and critics really picked up Fanon's ideas and brought them into in direct ways and explicit ways, but also indirectly he influenced kind of like how people were making film and art more generally. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. And especially thanks for the mention of the L.A. Rebellion films. I think of uh, films such as Bush Mama, Blessed Little Hearts, um, even Daughters of the Dust uh, and and the works of Zainabu uh, Davis and things like that, which is directly uh, engaging in this. And like you said, um, uh, establishing third cinema. Uh, as an anti-colonial uh, film uh, movement, uh, which uh, really um, uh, moved beyond uh, the colonial borders, uh, dividing people. And I think that in many ways, uh, it all, it, understanding third cinema as a tradition within the U.S. at that time as well really also helps us understand uh, the importance of the uh, idea of domestic colonialism, which had uh, driven uh, the Black Power activism at that time to, uh, uh, you know, as we'll talk about later on, you know, you, we'll hear Malcolm and others uh, understanding that, hey, you know, what's happening to the people in Algeria is the exact same thing uh, that's happening to the people here. So in your book, you describe the Battle of Algiers as a boomerang, a film whose life has never ended. Why has the Battle of Algiers maintained such a mass appeal over the past 55 years? Nine days after 9-11, right, in, in all of the hysteria and, and confusion, um, you know, Congress is holding congressional hearings. Uh, they're holding hearings um, with about kind of, you know, the, 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 the quote unquote terrorist threats that they face and who's responsible. And, you know, in those congressional hearings within nine days, the Battle of Algiers is mentioned in Congress. Right. And, and, and so it comes up then. And then, of course, um, as you all mentioned in your in your preface, you know, that that. And this is, you know, I remember when the Pentagon all of a sudden in 2003, after the invasion of Iraq, right, like hold a screening of the film uh, as a way of kind of, you know, trying to to try to help win the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and then, then, of course, as we come to find out, it becomes kind of required viewing at, at, at U.S. Army colleges and it becomes kind of a seminal text for for the Pentagon and, and the U.S. war machine. Uh, to understand, quote unquote, uh, what's happening um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think the film has kind of always had this history where you ha it's been a appropriated by both right wing dictators and military juntas as a way of, right, um, uh, kind of trying to control populations. But it's also really been embraced by a broad section of leftist groups from the Palestinian Liber Liberation Organization, you know, um, the IRA, the Black Panther Party, right, Chicano activists here in Los Angeles, right, all around the world, um, leftist activists rallied around the film because they saw themselves in the Battle of Algiers. They saw themselves as Algerians in some way. They can identify with what the Algerians were going through. So I think the film has built into it this kind of like tension. But I think, you know, more specifically, and I think this is really what I wanted to get out with the book was that, you know, especially after 9-11, because I think 9-11, you know, oftentimes people see this as a breaking point. Uh, and, that, that it, you know, and, and that September 10th, 2001, and September 11th, 2001 are just a radical break, right? And, and I think I, I don't see it as a radical break I think there were some fundamental things that changed after 9-11, but I do think that the war on terror, as it's been called, is really a continuation and extension of a centuries-long colonial project, right? Um, and so I, I really was struck by, uh, you know, the, the novelist and writer Viet uh, Tan Nguyen in, in his book, Never, Nothing Ever Dies. He writes that all wars are fought twice, the first time on the battlefield and the second time in memory. Right. And, and to me, when when the Pentagon, after the war on terror, um, used the Battle of Algiers, right, 
um, in the way that they wanted to use it. For me, it was really this fundamental attempt to to steal the legacy of the film and and the memory of decolonization that for so many of us means so much and and that was still ongoing in 2001, 2, 3, 4, and even today, right? They, so they saw the film as a film about how to do counterinsurgency, when in fact the film was about how do people resist colonial occupation and oppression, right? That was the ethical and emotional weight of the film. I mean, you watch that film and you can't help but identify with the Algerians, right? This film will continue to resonate, right? as long as the unfinished project of decolonization remains unfinished. As long as people are continuing to be oppressed, the Battle of Algiers will always be relevant. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, thanks for that. Just an interesting little tidbit is that as doing some research for this show, I found that the Battle of Algiers was aired in the Panther 21 case uh, back in 19. 19- 70. Uh, as right, I, right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wrote about that in the book, in the, in the Panther 21 case. I mean, and, and, and uh, Afini Shakur was one of them. And she was pregnant with who we all know now as Tupac. The prosecution in the Panther 21 case thought that they could show the film in the courthouse to the jury as a way of convincing the jury that, see, look at these people. These Panther 21, they're crazy. They're terrorists. They want to destroy. They're, 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 you know, they don't, they're just these irrational kind of savages. Like that, that was the prosecution's attempt. And, of course, we come to find out that you know, the jury acquits the Panther 21 and whatnot. And when the jurors are interviewed afterwards, juror after juror is saying, uh, yeah, I really, my mind really got changed when I saw the Battle of Algiers. I actually understood the Panther 21 more after watching the film <laughs> yeah, right, than right. I did before. You know what I mean? So like it completely uh, backfired on him. Yeah, yeah. Backfired on him. Yeah, yeah. And at this moment you knew you messed up. Yeah, right, exactly. Right, right, like, right. You know? And so yeah, and, and and that was the kind of impact that the film had when it was screening all over the country. Like you had people in the theaters yelling, like, and I write about this in the book. Like in 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 Los Angeles, they had this film with um, it was a part of a festival of radical films here, right when the Vietnam War was popping off, and they showed it here in Los Angeles. And you had Panthers who were at the screening yelling, "America's next." Right. Like in the theater. Right. And the L.A. Times reporter is talking about this almost in this kind of alarmist tone. Like, oh, my God, like here's a film where you had Black Panthers come in and are yelling America's next. Like, what could this mean? Right. So the film definitely resonated with people in different ways. You are listening to the People's War Radio Show, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we're discussing the 55th anniversary of the Battle of Algiers with Professor Sohel Dolatsai, author of 50 Years of the Battle of Algiers, Past as Prologue. So, we've been talking about the film The Battle of Algiers. Now, let's look more at the events that inspired it. At the founding conference of the Organization of African Unity in May 1963, there was an ideological struggle waged between neocolonial accommodationists and revolutionaries such as Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser, and Algeria's Ahmed Ben Bella, and Nkrumah's fighting for a united socialist Africa. Following the talk at the OAU conference amongst many of the sellout leaders for the primacy of an African banking system, Ben Bella took to the podium and stated the following. There has been talk of a development bank, said Ben Bella. Why have we not talked about setting up a blood bank to help those who are fighting all over Africa? Nasser and Ben Bella stood as the closest allies to Nkrumah, while Pan-Africanist leaders such as Julius Nyeri, Kenneth Kaunda, and others abandoned Nkrumah's vision. You write quite a bit on Ben Bella. Can you explain his importance? Yeah, I mean, Ben Bella to me is just one of the most compelling figures of that time. Um, and as you mentioned, I appreciate the question, um, Dexter, like, uh, you know, his, 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 his role and his alliance with, um, both Nasser and Nkrumah, um, and his desire to kind of promote revolutionary struggles and support revolutionary struggles. I mean, this becomes part of Algeria's DNA, if you will. 
uh, even before they achieved, quote unquote, independence in 1962. I mean, they, they see themselves, especially after the Cuban Revolution in 1959, they see themselves explicitly as the Cuba of Africa, right? They're deeply inspired by what happens in Cuba and Fidel and, and Che's desire to kind of, you know, export revolutionary struggle and support it throughout the world, right? Um, and so, you know, even prior to their uh, independence, quote unquote, um, uh, you know, Fanon, who's, who works in Algiers, who works for the FLN, he works in their newspaper, El Mujahid, right? He, he's, he writes in the paper regularly and, you know, he travels to kind of Ghana, Right. Where they had the FLN had a diplomatic office open in Ghana even before independence. He's making speeches about the importance of revolutionary struggle throughout the continent. Right. And even by 1960, again, two years before their own revolutionary struggle. Right. Um, Algeria is providing material, diplomatic and political support to various struggles throughout the continent. Cameroon, the Congo, Senegal, Ivory Coast, Mali, Morocco, Tunisia, Niger. Um, they're forming rebel alliances with groups in Kenya, in, in, in what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, Angola, and even apartheid South Africa, right? And, and, and they have training camps um, in, in Morocco, Tunisia, and Mali. Of course, they couldn't have them in Algeria because the French wouldn't let them. Um, and, and, and that became a meeting ground for kind of like a, a broad range of, of guerrillas and revolutionaries. Um, ben Bella becomes a key engine in this. And of course, that blood bank that you're referring to at that famous OAU meeting where he challenges and, and you know, he challenges the, the, the OAU states to join him and Nkrumah and Nasser in, in kind of supporting, right, um, revolutionary struggle throughout the continent and creating a kind of continental, if you will, front against kind of European colonialism. Because, of course, the development bank, of course, kind of has to play into a kind of capitalist kind of ethos, right? And, and and much of that development bank was about kind of forging alliances with former colonial powers on their terms. And so Ben Bella and Nkrumah and, 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 and Nasser were really about pushing back on that idea and saying, we have to kind of gain a certain kind of, li- we have to gain liberation and a kind of revolutionary consciousness that's, go- that's going to allow us to kind of establish our own terms for how we engage with the rest of the world. And sadly, you know, this is the struggle. I mean, you see this in the film, right? When 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 Benamini is on the rooftop with Ali Lapointe, right? And he says, and it's a really powerful moment where he says, you know, fighting a revolution is hard. You know, um, winning a revolution is even harder. But the hardest thing is to is what we do after we win the revolution, right? Like, how do we build a society? And I think this is the crux of our condition in the third world, if we, you know, in terms of the global south is we're still struggling with that question. That really makes me think about Malcolm. In the United States, the Algerian Revolution played a significant role in the political development of Malcolm X, as you note in your writings. Malcolm made uh, multiple references to the Algerian struggle in his speeches. We found a recording of Malcolm's 1964 speech at the Militant Labor Forum in New York. In this speech, Malcolm opens up with a comparison of the colonial violence in Algeria and the colonial violence faced by African communities in the U.S. Let's take a listen. As far as I'm concerned, everybody who has caught the same kind of hell that I have caught is my blood brother. And I have plenty of them. Because all of us have caught the same hell. So the question is, if they don't exist, should they exist? Not do they exist, should they exist? Do they have a right to exist? And since when must a man deny the existence of his blood brother? It's like denying his family. (laughs) Excuse me if I speak a little loud here for a moment. If we're going to talk about police brutality, it's because police brutality exists. Why does it exist? Because our people in this particular society live in a police state. A black man in America lives in a police state. He doesn't live in any democracy. He lives in a police state. That's what it is. That's what Harlem is. And I recall uh, this book that just came out, uh, written by Lieberman, Silberman, rather, called Crisis in Black and White. I advise everybody here, read it. Crisis in Black and White by Charles Silberman. 
in my opinion, it's a good analysis of the problems that confront black people as well as white people in this country, and it goes right down to the root cause that has produced all these conditions, and it doesn't apologize for anybody. It shows where the fault lies on both sides. And this uh, book stems from an article that the author originally wrote in Fortune magazine, the March issue, 1962, at which time he stated that if something isn't done to relieve the black people in these Negro communities across the country of the injustices and frustrations that they are confronted with every day, that this country would see a time when the Negro communities from coast to coast would become like the Casbah. The Casbah, I fortunately was able to visit myself two weeks ago. I visited the one in, in Casablanca and I visited the one in Algiers with some of the brothers, blood brothers. Uh, they took me all down into it and showed me the suffering, showed me the conditions that they had to live under while they were being occupied by the French, who were supposedly their friends, supposedly their protectors, supposedly their benefactors. They showed me the conditions that they lived under while they were colonized by these people from Europe. And they also showed me what they had to do to get those people off their back. The first thing they had to realize that all of them were brothers. Oppression made them brothers. Exploitation made them brothers. Degradation made them brothers. Discrimination made them brothers. Segre segregation made them brothers. Humiliation made them brothers. And once all of them realized that they were blood brothers, they also realized what they had to do to get that man off their back. They lived in a police state. Algeria was a police state. Any occupied territory is a police state. And this is what Harlem is. Harlem is a police state. It's the police in Harlem, their presence is like occupation forces, like an occupying army. They're not in Harlem to protect us. They're not in Harlem to look out for our welfare. They're in Harlem to protect the interests of the businessmen who don't even live there. They are, they're there. The same conditions that prevailed in Algeria, that forced the people, the noble people of Algeria, to resort eventually to the terrorist-type tactics that were necessary to get the monkey off their back, those same conditions prevail today in America in every Negro community. And I would be, uh, other than a man, to stand up here and tell you that the uh, Afro-Americans, the black people who live in these uh, communities under these conditions are ready and willing to continue to sit around nonviolently and patiently and peacefully looking for some good will to change the conditions that exist. No, and you are out of your mind. If you think that our people, it's easy for you to live in another neighborhood and be sympathetic to the cause and then come in with some nonviolent tactics and think that we too will think that that's sufficient. But if you had to live under those conditions and suffer what our people suffer, you would have gotten rid of that nonviolence a long time ago. That was Malcolm X's speech at the 1964 Militant Labor Forum. So, uh, Sahel, how did the Algerian Revolution influence Malcolm and others in the 1960s? I mean, it, it, and I, it's a great question. I mean, Cabral, you know, Emil Cabral, you know, refers to Algeria as the Mecca of revolution, right? Um, that's his kind of famous quote. Um, and, and Algeria really came to embody that. Um, and, and and so uh, you know, not to fast forward, but in '69, of course, it becomes like the the, the Nkrumah names Algiers as the the site for the first ever uh, Pan African Cultural Arts Fest. Baldwin, of course, is in Paris, and Baldwin writes extent not extensively, but significantly on kind of Algeria and France and and and, and that relationship. And so you had this influence, right? And of course, Fanon's writings become picked up later on by by the Panthers. And, and as I mentioned before, their relationship to, to, to Algiers and the Algerian struggle. But Malcolm, Malcolm spends one day in Algiers in his travels. But Algiers, again, obviously captures Malcolm's imagination, right? And, and so for Malcolm, in the piece that you shared, right, he's talking about a police state and he's making these comparisons between Harlem as a police state 
and Algiers and Algeria as a police state, right? And saying that when you have a police state, you are going to have people who aren't going to put up with it and they're going to resist it and they're going to challenge it, right? And so um, I think, again, it was part and parcel of Malcolm's internationalism, right? His radical internationalism, where, as Malcolm would say, right, what the police do locally, the military do globally, meaning the U.S. military, right? We have to see them as, you know, flip sides of the same coin. But Malcolm was also referencing colonial kind of armies and colonial militaries, like in this case, the French and the U.S. police, what the police in Harlem are doing are the same thing as what the French military are doing in Algeria. And if the brothers in Algeria and the sisters in Algeria who are resisting that occupation, uh, they have a right to do it. Uh, it's their obligation and duty to do it. Then don't be surprised when that happens here in Harlem or Watts or Chicago or anywhere else in the United States. And so Algeria played a really formative role in kind of shaping kind of a, a kind of third world consciousness. And that, there was already one here in the United States among black activists and organizers. But what I'm saying is it gave them another lens by which to understand their, their own experiences or better understand the forces of power that were structured against them. Right? Exactly, exactly. And we know that Baldwin and, uh, uh, exactly, 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 exactly. And we know that Baldwin had stated that it was in France that the Algerian was Les Miserables, which uh, I think mm-hmm. uh, was a profound uh, political statement and really, uh, really turns some of what people understand as Marxist theory on its head, uh, under centering the colonial question uh, at the center of um, the class question. Uh, and 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 any in many ways, you know, not to go too much into it for the sake of time, but but that is also central to the uh, struggle in Algeria between the uh, Algerian people and the people they call the Piet Noir, right? The sort of right. co- uh, colonized um, mm-hmm. settler colonial class of French people, uh, not unlike maybe uh, the Boers of South Africa or something like that. Did you mention the Pied Noirs, Matsumela? And I think they 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 were, you know, the, the French government in Paris, we have, we have to understand the French government in Paris, they at a certain point they realized, especially after Dien Bien Phu in, in, in Vietnam in 54 when they lost there, and Malcolm's famous speech, Message to the Grassroots. You remember Dien Bien Phu, like he's already telling black people here about how weak these colonial empires can be if we push back on them, right? But but De Gaulle, the French recognized that the war in Algeria was a lost war, uh, and they were trying to negotiate a truce. But it was the Pied Noir, the people who had been born. Remember, Algeria was a settler colony, right? You had generations of French people who moved there and were born there, two, three generations deep, right? They saw Algeria not as Algeria. That was French Algeria. It was France. They saw it as their home. And, and, and so even though De Gaulle wanted to leave, they didn't. And so there was a split, right? And so you had these, you almost had like a civil war going on in France between the Pied Noir and the French military. I only say that to say that like they became a kind of rogue element, if you will. And when the war was over, right, they spread throughout the third world. And many of the generals who supported the Pied Noir shared their tactics with military government. They got, they got brought in by the U.S. military and the CIA. Right. To share their know how and knowledge, especially in the U.S. war in Vietnam, but also Operation Condor in South America and anywhere that the United States wanted to kind of go. So the the point I'm making is French counterinsurgency in Algeria has been deeply influential since the Algerian war, since the 1960s, in shaping counterinsurgency tactics throughout the world. Right. So much so. And I mentioned this in the book that. The U.S. blueprint for counterinsurgency, what's called the Petraeus Doctrine, right? That for, after General Petraeus here, the Petraeus Doctrine is completely modeled after David Galula's French counterinsurgency manuals in Algeria. You're listening to the People's War Radio Show, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we're discussing the 55th anniversary of the Battle of Algiers with Professor Sahel Dolatsai author of 50 Years of the Battle of Algiers, Past as Prologue. 
Malcolm X was assassinated just days before he was supposed to speak at the Afro-Asian Conference in Nigeria in late February 1965. As you noted in Black Star Crescent Moon, Malcolm was expected to share the podium with Jake Guevara. That Afro-Asian conference was one in a series of attempts to unite the African and Asian world in anti-colonial socialist struggle. The most notable of these convenings was the Bandung Conference of 1955. Malcolm talked about Bandung. What was the Bandung Conference? It was the Afro-Asian Conference in Bandung, Indonesia, in, in, in 29 countries um, that were half the world's population at the time. Right, attended Bandung. Bandung was about bringing, for the first time ever, third world peoples together uh, to have a conference on how to chart a course forward in this new moment of kind of anti-colonial and national liberation struggles. Again, it's only 1955, so there's, you know, in terms of the countries, the number of countries that have broken free from their former colonial uh, uh, oppressors, it isn't that many relative to what comes afterwards, right? And so Bandung is really a shot across the bow to the Western powers in terms of like, here are third world peoples getting together to talk about their situation and what they're going to do without us in the room. But what Bandung did more broadly was, is it, it, it sets in motion a series of gatherings you know, 1957, right, was a was a follow up conference, the Afro Asian People Solidarity Organization, which meets in Cairo, right, um, and that's the same year, of course, that Nkrumah leads Ghana to independence from Britain, and then in 58, Toure, right, leading uh, declaring Ghanaian independence, and then 58, Iraq and Abdul Karim Qasim uh, kind of you know overthrow the British and U.S. backed monarchy in Iraq, right, so. There's a series of meetings. And then in 1961, the, the non-aligned movement was born. Non-aligned meant here are third world countries because this is the Cold War. And they're being asked to choose. Are you going to roll with the United States or are you going to roll with the Soviet Union? Right. And you got to pick. And some people, some countries had to choose. For example, Castro was like, I'm 90 miles away from the biggest thugs in the game. So I need some backup, you know. And so he aligns himself explicitly with the Soviet Union. Right. But. The non-aligned movement sought to kind of chart an independent course, a third way, right? Again, this is back to this first, second, third. It's got different meanings here. First is the capitalist world. Second is the kind of, you know, Soviet, you know, controlled Soviet order, right? And the third is the third way. We're going to try to chart our own way, right? A kind of revolutionary socialism, a third world socialism that's different than or that has to negotiate these other two. And so... Bandung really like sets in motion a series of gatherings and conferences that, like I said, in 61 is the non-aligned movement. But of course, to me, the embodiment of this is really the 1996, 19, sorry, the 1966 Tri-Continental Conference in Havana, Cuba, right? The Tri-Continent, the three continents, Africa, Asia, Latin America, that really uh, explicitly and more forcefully than Bandung or any of the other gatherings before it says, we are going to provide support and we are for armed struggle against colonial oppression and capitalist exploitation, right? The Tricontinental in 1966 really like breaks it open and that becomes, and, 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 and at the Tricontinental, they also include then Black power and Chicano and uh, Puerto Rican kind of revolutionaries in the United States as well. They see them as part of the tricontinental. And so Bandung really, you know, becomes an opening for this. And of course, Malcolm talks about the Bandung and his message to the grassroots in 1963, you know, in a very historic speech, right? He's, he uses Bandung as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a metaphor and an analogy for Black people, right? That we don't have to sit down with white people in order to determine our future. We can sit together and get on the same page and then chart a course forward, much like they did in Bandung. Like he says in the speech and Methods to the Grassroots, they had a common enemy. He's talking about the countries who met in Bandung, right? He was blonde haired and blue eyed, right? Um, and so they knew, Malcolm knew that at Bandung, white supremacy was the enemy. And he was using that as a way for black people to start to think about their relationship to how to deal with racial apartheid in America, right? So Bandung is, 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 is tremendously significant in how we think about this history of decolonization and national liberation struggle. Mm, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
You're listening to the People's World Radio Show, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we are discussing the 55th anniversary of the Battle of Algiers with Professor Sahel Dalatsai, author of 50 Years of the Battle of Algiers, Past as Prologue. Uhuru, uhuru, Sahel. So, you write about a wide array of popular culture, namely hip-hop. We haven't talked much about it in this interview, but how has hip-hop culture been a popular source of anti-colonial solidarity amongst African, Arab, and Asian peoples? And what role has Islam played in that? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge question. Uh, we can almost do a whole show on this. I mean, obviously, you know, hip-hop emerges out of the kind of dispossession and apartheid, apartheid system of, of the United States in terms of Black and um, Brown communities. And, and it becomes a vehicle, you know, for them to kind of speak truth to power, you know, and, and, and kind of uh, talk about their experiences in, in a way that uh, other mediums could not do or would not do. So, of course, we know, you know, we, I can, we can spend time talking about even this trajectory here in the U.S. context in terms of what it's done and in terms of like, you know, uh, mid 80s to mid 90s in terms of like shaping a kind of revolutionary ethos and how Malcolm X was the most sampled voice in hip hop and the kind of revolutionary consciousness that was created and a whole range of artists and groups from Rakim and Public Enemy and Brand Nubian and Poor Righteous Teachers and, you know, to, to different kind of sensibilities with like Gangstar and Tribe Called Quest and of course Ice Cube here in Los Angeles and you know, we, we can, we can, I can, I can go on um, with, with those. And then even after that, with different artists like Yassi Bey and, you know, the roots continued into it and Dead Prez. Um, so, so there's a tremendous kind of history with that. And of course, this gets picked up by colonized peoples across the world. And so you see hip hop now in, in, in England and in France and in, in Holland and in Germany picked up by diasporic immigrant communities, many of them from the African continent, right? But also in places like Palestine, where you have groups who are using hip hop um, in the tradition of spoken word poetry that comes out of, you know, Palestine and, and, and Arab literary traditions, right? And merging those into a form that we can now call hip hop, but that borrow from their own traditions that come through a kind of more, you know, hip hop frame, if you will. And they're speaking about their conditions um, and, and using them as, as, as amp- using hip hop as a kind of amplification of, of, of their messages. So hip hop has really become, you know, uh, a, a source for people. I mean, I think it's where you find, it's, it's the same thing I was saying about the battle of Algiers. It's always going to be relevant wherever there is oppression. Right. And I think, In those same places where there's oppression is where you're going to find the seeds of hip hop, right? Hip hop will be there, too, if it doesn't already exist. At the very foundation of hip hop culture is the presence of Islam through the early Zulu nation and their their references to both the nation of Islam, but also the Quran in terms of like guiding principles for how to shape a kind of uh, cultural practice, right? That's about giving dignity, but speaking to something that's kind of eternal, uh, but that's also about defiance, right, and pushing back against oppression. Islam and hip hop have a deep history, and all those groups I mentioned, uh, Brand Nubian, you know, uh, uh, Poor Righteous Teachers, Public Enemy, Tribe Called Quest, The Roots, Gangstar, Diggable Plant. I mean, I, there's just so many. We can just go on and on. Yasin Bey, the, you know, it, it just it just continues to this day. Um, Islam has continued to be a kind of bedrock for a kind of alternative black consciousness in the United States. I really appreciate you having on, having you on the show with us today. And I wanted to ask you um, if there are any final thoughts that you want to share with us. Uh, you know, I mean, I think I kind of, you know, tried to say everything. I mean, I just really appreciate the platform that you both have created um, as a space for, for talking ideas. I think ideas are really important. I mean, action is obviously uh, what's going to make a difference, but you know, we need, ideas that are going to that are going to inspire us towards certain kinds of action right and so i just really wanted to say that 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 the platform you all are providing and and the space you offered for me to come in and and share some thoughts and ideas is just i'm really appreciative of that hey so you know um you know tell the people where they can can find you you know do you have any 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 new works coming out where can people find your stuff 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just right now. It's you know, I'm on a couple of the social media. I'm not very active as much as I maybe was in the past. I've just kind of tried to take a break from that. Um, but I am still on kind of Instagram and Twitter and whatnot. Um, but you know, I think I'm just working right now on doing some writing and uh, you know, getting behind the camera, and trying to get some get some filmmaking stuff that I'm trying to put together and develop. You know, and so yeah, sorry for not being. Uh, specific and clear but but yeah these, these these things are very much in the formative stages and so um i don't know what they're going to end up being but you know they'll, they'll definitely be out sometime soon thanks thanks for that and you know one thing i wanted to note before we end is the revolutionary way through which you actually published battle of algiers uh past as prologue because it's small. It's just a small book. You, there's a lot packed in there because they use a smaller writing of smaller font, but, but it's a small book that can really uh, fit in anybody's pocket, which uh, really um, underscores the, uh, the, the working class politic uh, yeah, in, uh, yeah, within your academic work. It's something that a, a worker can have in their pocket, whether on the job and read the chapters. They're not extremely long chapters, so you can get through it. Uh, but it's packed with a whole lot of information. Uh, that that's a writing style that really has um, uh, most people who call themselves radical intellectuals have um, foregone. But uh, you have right. No, I appreciate that, Matsumala. Like you know, uh, appreciate you recognizing that. That's exactly what I was thinking. You know, I mean, I I wanted to do this as a kind of manifesto like text. You know, like. The, the 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 60s and 70s kind of pamphlets and manifestos that were passed around and handed to people on street corners and at bazaars and whatnot or in, in independent bookstores, right? That they were small and you can carry with you and pick up on the bus and read on the train or at your, you know what I mean? Um, and so I really wanted to do something in that vein. Um, and, you know, that that approach and style was something that was really important to me. So it's it's I, I really appreciate you picking up on that, you know, because that's definitely something that I wanted to do. I had different offers from different publishers to do it um, in different ways. And I, I, I just said no to them. I wanted to keep it small, compact, short um, and have a kind of urgency. Right. Um, in the text um, that I hope hopefully comes out in the text. Um, but that was definitely at the front. That was the priority for me was that tradition of writing and accessibility. You know, you have been listening to the People's World Radio Show. Today, we discuss the 55th anniversary of the Battle of Algiers with Professor Sahel Dolatsai, author of 50 Years of the Battle of Algiers, Past as Prologue. Our theme song, Colonial Virus, was written and performed by Aliki Angoma. Thanks to the People's World Radio Show's production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and a hipster panda. Uhuru. So we say down with the colonial virus. Down with the colonial virus. This has been the People's World Radio Show. Produced by WBPU Black Power Radio at 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. WBPU is a project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund. The baddest nonprofit on the planet. Whose mission is to defend the human and civil rights of the African community. And address the grave disparities faced by African people in education, health care, and economic development. For more information on the African People's Education and Defense Fund, visit apedf.org. Episodes of the People's War Radio Show are available on the Black Power Talks podcast. For updates and resources to fight the coronavirus or to volunteer with Project Black Onk, visit developmentforafrica.org. Thank you for listening. Colonial virus, mass incarceration, that's colonial virus.